in the previous episode. Wait! No! No! No, did I kill Zack? No! Hello everybody, we are back. Um, so I have actually recorded this episode already. There are a lot of things we need to do. Unfortunately, my audio was not recording, which is really annoying. So I already know quite a lot that's going to happen and I'm sorry about that. Um, I was just going to put audio behind my initial reaction, but it's just a lot of talking. Uh, just to keep things quite succinct, I did kill Zack last game and we are going to replay it so that he survives really quickly. Really quickly. Okay, so we are back at the point where I believe Zack was going to die. What I did was enter through the open window which got me arrested and therefore killed, so instead we are going to keep looking for Ash. Someone could be in danger. Keep looking for Ash. In the end, the rational part of my brain wins out. The half that has spent too much time around Ash. It's right though, the reasonable part. If I do force my way in and find something unpleasant, how am I going to fight back? With my camera? No matter where you look at it, that's simply asking for a painful death. I have a better chance if I find Ash. What is he stooping about? Perhaps I should try the forest. Make a round farther into the gardens. Not a sound plan, but it's better than nothing. The woman's soft sobs have subsided now by some means. Almost inaudible, to the point where I'm wondering if I truly heard what I heard. I didn't get to dwell on it much though, because right in that moment my phone rings. The sharp notes, cutting, piercing through the thick quietude. I clamp hand over it, pressing the button before the speakers are close to my ear. I only caught the tail end of the person's greeting on the other side, but I know the voice well enough. What was that, Ash? Could you repeat that? Signal shitty here. I asked, where are you? Hell, Zach, I've been calling your number for a good 20 minutes now. What kind of shithole did you get into? Good morning to you, too. I should be asking you that question. I've been looking all over the mansion for you. I thought you'd be... What mansion? Do I really need to answer that? Why are you even... No. No, wait. Just get your ass here at Isabella's place in a hurry. I shift my gaze into the mansion, specifically at the window I heard the cries from. There is nothing of it now, not even echoes. How urgent is this? Pressing enough for you to stop asking questions and get yourself here. Please, Zack. That gives me a pause. It's a rare thing for him to take on that tone. I'll be there in a few. An hour or two tops. Thanks. I'll see ya. I rush back to my bike as soon as the call ends. A terrified Zachary went looking for Ashton in the Ermengard mansion, but to no avail. He also tried to warn Luke Wright about the spirit supposedly living in the house, but was simply turned away. As he was about to give up, he received an urgent call from Ashton, ordering him to head straight for Salem Well Residences. Without another look, I leave the mansion along with its haunting melodies and grim echoes behind. There are more important things than my own curiosity and impulses. Marianne. 7.15pm. New. Profiles. Marianne McCulloch. July 4th, Cancer, 30 years old, 5'11", interior designer, Irish, Roman Catholic, Bachelor of Arts in Architecture, Chocolate, Cats, Classical Arts, Country Music, Karaoke, Board Games, Video Games, Anime and other obscure pop culture items, Yoga. I feel like Marianne was made to be liked, cause like... <laughs> Left in a dumpster as a baby, she was found by a peddler and spent most of her childhood roaming the countryside in a beat-up van. Her father taught her how to read, write and pray, though an unconventional life it was all she knew. Child welfare and protection eventually caught on and required that she have a proper education. She was provided a scholarship at St. Samantha's School for young ladies and was bullied for being a charity kid. Marianne only had one friend and was mostly focused on her studies, intent on graduating and returning to her father, a shame that he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's soon after. Her work as an architect in Ireland lasted until the Irish economic crisis. She moved to England and after some time, luck born in search of better career opportunities. 7.15pm the numbers are so little on the top of my screen and they glare at me with such intensity that I can just hear their accusations. I'm late for a night out with the girls, yes, but I have a perfectly good excuse at G's. Considering I didn't follow typical office hours, they really can't expect me to be able to just go as I please at 5.30 on the dot. The client is, first and foremost, my priority. I have to sit tight when my personal assistant, Chris, tells me we have a big one coming up and that I shouldn't miss this one. He knows a lot more than the who's who and the what's what when it comes to these socialites, and I trust that judgement call. 
I really don't have time for rich people, their drama, and their politics. The sorts who were born with silver spoons in their mouths and who were used to wagging their silver tongues about. I let him handle the negotiating with them for the most part. Why else would I have hired him? But he told me I'd receive a message about it an hour ago. Now, if only he has the full shilling when it comes to the time. Come on, I have a social life too, you know, to an extent. Sort of. Pressing my head against the table, I try to stave off an oncoming headache when the notification for a new email pops up. All I'm expecting is a, hey, this looks like a good project I found, go send them a design, or something like that, really, that's how often it goes. Even with these rich jammy clients who've heard of me from their equally rich jammy friends, I can't expect them to hire me right off the bat. Which is all well and good and reasonable. We figure out what they want, send them my portfolio, my drafts for their projects, my rates, and hope for the best. This is a big client, Marianne. I'll babysit Ruthie all for you. Just please take this one project. I promise this person is huge in Luxborn. Mr. Parker, this is a formal request to secure the services of Marianne McCulloch, hereinafter called the designer. As authorised by Hannah Wright, hereinafter called the client, for interior design work at Ermengarde Mansion Luxborn, LX 180RF, United Kingdom. I already looked it up. It doesn't exist, obviously. <laughs> The client hopes to have the designer there on the 21 October, not 21st, <laughs> Friday with the time pending. But as I open the mail and see that I've been requested by the client specifically, <gasps> by, sent by Mr. Johans. Well, I certainly didn't expect that and it's pretty straightforward too. Anyone else would probably be excited. They would be working with THE Hannah Wright. She is just one of those rich socialites that everyone loves to talk about, no matter how hard I try to tune out such nonsense. It would have been enough for me to reply in an affirmative to Chris and leave, but he has never pleaded for me to take a project before. We've worked with big personalities in the past, celebrities, bankers, and even a few politicians. My PA had been indifferent about those. So the question bounced about my skull before I spy one of the email attachments. A newspaper clipping from the Luxborn Daily's business news section boasting the headline, Right Enterprise donates 2.5 million to refugee? Refuge? At the grand opening of a new Wright Hotel last Wednesday, our local billionaire couple, Luke and Hannah Wright, announced the donation of £2.5 million to help Luxborn Refuge keep their services open. Unexpected, but certainly welcome. This follows only a month after the couple's previous donation of the same amount to the Save the Children in the UK. One of the largest donations, this amount will help keep the safe house in Luxborn open for several years. With this money, Refuge can keep helping women, children, and victims of domestic violence. There are rumours as well of the charity talking with the couple and looking into building a local centre equivalent to their Gaia and Athena locations. These rumours have come to us due to one of the Enterprise's employees mentioning a Project EOS. It certainly caused quite a stir back then. Apparently they had invited businessmen and socialites everywhere in the guise of it being some business announcement. Two and a half mil and an expensive looking party to boot. These people sure know how to throw their money around. Not that I should be so callous. They're going to do a lot of good and help a community of people with all those pounds. I, of all people, shouldn't criticise such acts whether they were for show or not. At the very least, I know they'll be able to pay my rates. With the headline out of the way, I find myself staring at the picture that came along with the clipping. Because, wow. Here I am expecting a sour old woman in a blazer and skirt. But the woman that was plastered on the front page like she belongs on the front page of the entertainment section or even, if I am to be crass, as the pin-up for a glamour. Okay, I'll be real here, a men's magazine. She sure knows how to rock that dress. Wait. Her hair, her eyes, her lips. She can't be her. And at the same time, she is her, only several years older. She looks just like... No, come on, Mac. The world is full of pretty blondes. It's just a coincidence. With a shake of my head, I snap out of it and reach out for my phone when it buzzes, nearly falling off my chair in the process. An email from the Wrights came requesting Marianne McAuliffe's experience for their home. What seemed like an innocent commission made a different impact on the famous designer after seeing a picture of the Wrights' missus. Who else would be on the other line but the very people waiting for me? Oh, piss. I'm so sorry, Calm. I'm on my way. That's what I say. Yet I still don't move from my chair, face flushed and heart racing. I can only stare until I can will myself to reply that yes, I am accepting the assignment. And it takes even more time for me just to close the image, shut down the computer and leave. Even then, it has already burned its image into my head, no matter how much I wish it would just disappear. 
It makes me eager for the alcohol in the company. It makes me eager for anything that can help me forget. It's a good thing that the nearest pub is just a hop, skip and jump from here. The Galway Shawl, as it's called by those who frequented the place, is the only decent Irish pub in this country. You can pretty much tell that someone is new if they call it by its official name, the Crawl Bar. My home away from home ever since I've moved to Luxbourne. Well, that is when I'm not cooped up in my condo and working in any way. It has good alcohol, good company, and thank God and St. Cecilia good music. Crowd favourites like the Bothy Noise, the High Wesleyan Men and Second Fusion Orchestra are often played. Not to mention the singing. I love singing. Anyone could just break out into a drinking song and the others in the pub were just wonderful that they'd start singing along. And doing so whilst intoxicated is the best of ways to go about it. Hey, it's a win-win as long as I don't puke in the middle of the chorus and as long as I can get home in one piece at the end of the day. And tonight is karaoke night. What better time than to try and sing all my worries away? That's what my intoxicated brain tells me. The ghost of guilt and sorrow remembers who I am. And in the prison of my heart, I was my only slave. But drinking only reminds me of my home, and the thought of home makes me think of her. But in the depths of my cold soul, I'll leave the burden and despair. This is not going with the music. It makes me nauseous. It sickens me that the smallest reminder of her can cause me such grief. I'll fight for what's worth fighting for. Forget the fear, forget the rest. Of course, that might just be the booze any other day. I would have scolded myself for drinking so much. I lied to the Lord, I lied to myself, I lied to you and everyone I care, until there were no more lies to tell. But I already have a client and we'll be having our first little meet and greet in a few days. Cowardice is easier than being brave, but at last I found the strength I lost to sing my love letter to you. Cause people can lie, but my lone heart beats true. I want to at least enjoy this night, get over the hangover tomorrow and return to being a prim and proper professional after. Oh, tongue twister. That song was for Cam, our lucky bride to be. So give her a hand, Galway shawl. Considering the state I'm in, one can excuse my smug grin as cheers and applause rise among the pub's patrons. There are like four people in here. Because, possibly off-key public singing aside, I feel like I'm on top of the world right now and that's a good reason as any to belt out in front of these strangers. With good drinks and good friends, there's nowhere else I'd rather be tonight. And I forgot for a short while. And that song was brought to you by Marianne McCullough, everyone! A round of applause! The same voice actor for Isabella. That was so good! You rock, Marianne. The uh, voice actor of Becca. Oh, please stop. You're just saying that. You know neither of us can hold a tune, Marianne. From what I remember, Haruna's on the right, smoking a cigarette, and Cam's on the left. A toast to our shameless drunk singer. May your drinks forever flow and your notes be ever lovely. If anyone deserves a toast tonight, that's Cam. Finally sealed the deal after three years, eh? Read them and wait, bitches. Kamala's diamond engagement ring gleams as she holds it up for all the world to see. She has reasons to be proud, three years of living together and her boyfriend finally asked her the big question. Obviously she said yes. Don't get too attached to that ring or the one after, sweetie. I was wearing a wedding ring not so long ago and look at where I am. But enough of me being a downer. Cheers to a happy engagement! Of course, if something like Haruna's divorce were to happen, I'd be there for Cam. Just as Cam had been there for me, acting more than just my yoga instructor, I can't be happier for my friend right now. Cheers! 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 Well, we both will be there for Cam, won't we, Haruna and I? Haruna, it's been a real bad year for her ever since her divorce. She's such a nice person, even loaning me money to open a studio, and she didn't deserve what her husband had pulled. I'm happy she's smiling again and pigging out like she used to. I think we've all missed our Japanese firecracker. We met in yoga class, something I had joined 
to keep myself in shape and well, honestly, so that I could make friends when I had moved to Luxbourne. Clearly it worked like a charm, and it definitely didn't have anything to do with the fact that I brought along my lucky d20 die with me on my first day, no sir. I love these girls so much. What about you, Marianne? You're 30 years old and you still haven't got yourself a man. And you guys know I have a very busy schedule. I don't have time for that. Oh, come on. That's a lame excuse and you know it. You need a man who will take care of you and you need it now. Maybe some hunk will be your house hubby while you rake in the dough. I'm quite capable of taking care of myself. Who needs a Mr. Right? Also, wait, I thought she was gay. <laughs> Hey, look at me, I'm Marion McCullough, a lawful neutral cleric with nine points in wisdom and eight in charisma, but I can't get myself a date. I mentioned druids and demons once, once. They don't even know the rules or understand what the numbers mean. And I certainly am not some sort of holy person. I am a far cry from a miracle worker and I barely have the willpower to fight off demons, especially my own. Actually, maybe she isn't looking for a Mr. Right, but a Mrs. Right. Eh. Oh, my Marianne, we still love you even if you're in the closet. That would explain some things. How do you know you don't have a ring anymore? Maybe you two can be together and I don't have to worry about my best girls being alone. What are you on about? There's nothing to explain. But the more I deny, the louder they tease until the other people in the pub start to watch. It doesn't help at all when Harona drapes her arm over my shoulder and leans in. Will I be all yours then? Will you be making me feel like a woman? I know that they're kidding around, but it doesn't make me comfortable in the slightest. So when Kamala noticed my silence and Haruna sees the expression on my face, they stop. And when the awkward air settles over as the rest of the pub goes back to whatever they were doing before the whole thing ever happened. They probably won't even remember when they wake up with the massive hangovers anyway. Sorry. Me too. Hey, no hard feelings, right? I raise my glass. They smile. We drink. There's no need to say more. We're all definitely far too drunk tonight. Eventually, the fun times end. It's a weekday after all. Who gets smashed on a weekday? <laughs> and with Harada being a nurse, she still has to get ready for her next shift. Cam also has a loving fiance waiting for her home and really didn't have to make a fuss about having left some buns in the oven when she took off early. Really, I understand. I was the one who insisted, who was determined to get pissed drunk anyway. Moving to the bar, I sit. Alone at last. Alone with a stranger! I haven't seen him here before, obviously not a regular. He hasn't said one word and just sits there savouring his drink. With his whiskey served neat in one hand and lighter in the other, it doesn't seem like he's noticed me yet. And maybe I should go before he does look my way. Because he was pretty and he was blonde and those two things plus alcohol never did me any good. A thought too late. Judging by the way his flushed face and dazed look in his eyes, he's as pissed drunk as I am. But whereas I feel like healing over, he looks like he's still ready to take the catwalk by storm. Really, he has just the air of one of those men who think they own the world. Hello there, sexy. Please don't stand up on my account. I already like what I see. Fancy a drink? It'll be on me. But then again, I might be pleasantly surprised if he proves me wrong. Want some between the sheets? Sex on the beach? I'm talking cocktails, of course. <laughs> Fat chance. But it doesn't matter, we both know how to play this game. And there are two different ways for the night to end. One thing or another, it is going to happen. The question is, what do I want to do? Oh no, that's fine. I'd rather order some blue balls or some AMF if you don't mind. What does AMF mean? AMF means adios, motherfucker, and it is along the Long Island iced tea cocktail route. He looks like he's about to say some witty retort, but stops himself and downs the rest of his whiskey. That's wine, by the way. I order a mint julep, and he gets another whiskey, and we start the customary small talk. Of course, the saying, ask me no questions, and I'll tell you no lies, goes without saying. We ask nothing about each other, offering up falsehoods to establish a strenuous, fake connection between two strangers at a pub, if only to pass the time. Whiskey, as I have come to call him, is supposedly 21 years old, single, takes care of his sick mother, and is a manager of some sort. Manager of what? I didn't care to listen to the details. Meanwhile, Mint, as he has come to call me, is 29 and I'm... What did I say I was again? Oh yes, I told him that I was a professional chocolate taster, because fuck it, if I'm going to lie about what my job is, I might as well make it fun. 
It's a pretty decent chat between two pretty drunk strangers. And maybe it's just me, but we might as fucking well expend the tiniest amount of effort in pretending that there's something meaningful in this meeting. Would have been nice too if it was just left at that. But during the London conversation, he brings it up. You know, I've never been with a woman taller than me. And to think he might have been different from the rest. Never have and never will, whiskey. Can we go back to the history of chocolates? Did you know that chocolate candy was introduced in 19th century England as a healthier alternative to alcohol? I looked that up, I think that's kinda true. St. Lucy was the most beautiful woman of her time. She had men come from the four corners of the world just to see the pure light of her exquisite green eyes. If she were so lucky anyway. <sighs> no, enough of the history lesson. Come on, Mint. You know and I know what you came here for. Though not every suitor was gallant, and she was no fool, she had known that sooner or later she wouldn't be able to defend her chastity. Come on. There must be something that gets you going. So she had taken out a knife and gouged out her own eyes. Hmm, there is something, but I don't think you can handle it. Impressed with her devotion, God restored her eyes and made them more beautiful than before. He has a peculiar sense of humour, hasn't he? Because that only meant suitors kept going after Lucy, and she kept her eyes in a chalice to scare them away. Oh, I'm pretty sure I can handle whatever it is. St. Lucy, help me. Help me turn away from sin. Help me with my own blindness. My place isn't too far from here. I won't take care of you if it ends up being too much for you. And no one will be able to hear you if you try to scream. You sure you want to go down that road, pretty boy? Wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> Tuesday, October 18th, Marianne went to the Crawl Bar, also called the Galway Shoal by its patrons, for a night out with her close friends Cam and Haruna. When they left, Marianne was seen with a stranger whom she only referred to as Whiskey, in turn she was called Mint. The best thing about having my condo so close to the pub is the ease of access. As long as I can still stand and walk, I can make it home. Maybe I'd need help from a kind neighbour or two to help me with the last leg if I've really gone overboard on the alcohol. It sounds like Marianne has a problem, <laughs> but I always made it home. Sometimes with company. Of course, that always comes with complications, especially with the real clingy ones. But it isn't anything a good tip about stalkers in their building security can't fix. I'm always nervous though, even if this isn't the first time I've done this. And the first few minutes when we enter my room are the first few agonising minutes when I try not to panic. Okay, Max, so far so good. Don't let him smell your fear under all that liquid courage. He'll leave sooner or later and I'll never have to see him again, just like every other man before him. I'd like to say to myself that the men I've brought to my place were more scared than I was. Yet there is no fear when I look into Whiskey's eyes, only delight. When he starts touching me, I don't even hesitate. When I push him against the door, roughness is to be expected. There is no NSFW descriptions. I would cut it out anyway, but there are any. And as long as he sticks to the script, everything will go smoothly. We'll have our little tumble in the sheets. He'll leave. We'll forget about it. If somebody asked what I really wanted, I would have told them that I wanted a bed of roses, chocolates and music, maybe in an Irish castle. But all I really want is her, and that's never going to be a reality. That was my fault, of course. Because I was afraid. Because I was a coward. They would never hold a candle up to her. She was the light of my life. And I had to let her go. I can't even be bothered at the thought of her. Just the single thought of her makes my resolve to see this affair through waver. <sighs> Wait. What is it now? Yes, what is it now? What is it going to be, Marianne? To sex or not to sex? Uh, so I, I, I did this is wrong. So I will do that one. Obviously, I want to. I want to fuck Luke over as much as possible. And wow, our relationship is pretty good actually. But yeah, fuck you, Luke. This is wrong. <laughs> We're both drunk. That, I can't leave that far. I am shocked. And this is wrong. Don't you think it's a bit fucked up that we're about to have sex and we're just calling each other by the drinks that we had? How messed up are we? Doll, shut up with the ethics and morality talk. It is seriously putting me out of the mood. If you want to leave now, Whiskey, I understand. I mean, with how smashed you are, it'd probably be best for you to sleep the night unless you want to be mugged. 
But I won't stop you. And this isn't going to happen. Bloody hell. Of course, he's annoyed at me for putting off our night of sexual congress. But no means no. And beyond spewing a few profanities under his breath, he's priding the Simbas down soon enough. I was worried for a moment that he might try to force something. Instead, he makes a show of fixing his suit and smoothing down his hair before making himself comfortable on the nearest seat he could find. What are you doing, then? You have a guest in your home. Put the damn kettle on. Dandelion tea if you have it. But I suppose all you have are those shitty tea bags from the store. If it isn't for the absurdity of this turn of events, I would have flipped on him for thinking I've no taste. But in the end, I just laugh. All I got are cans of Korean ginseng and lemon balm, though. No dandelion. Without a second thought, I do wet the tea. That's three minutes to get the kettle to a boil. It takes three minutes? Three minutes where we say nothing to each other. I mean, what do you even say to the guy who is going to sleep with until I change my mind? I doubt he's in the mood to talk about the influence of Troy's on Mallory. I'm not looking that up. It's still unusual by the time we're both seated on my bed with mugs of tea in hand. Just so you know, whatever is going on right now is a lot stranger and fucked up than the one night stand. We are two messed up individuals by your logic. Everything is messed up, if you ask me. War? Terrorism? Famine? Poverty? Loved ones and loved lost? Oh, this whole world is a cesspool. The dead air is selling when it fills the room once more. One would think that this is the perfect time to burst to spill about whatever issues has made us the fucked up person that we are today. And it is. But I guess some part of me would rather not put the weight of my problems on somebody else's shoulder. It wouldn't be fair to leave that to a person when I don't even know if we'll ever see each other again. Sooner rather than later, we both pass out on my bed, mugs left forgotten on the floor. You have... You can't see because my head's here. You... <laughs> they have a bedside table. It's like... There. <laughs> We're going to end the video here, guys. Let's see what happens in the next day. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry if I'm talking a little bit faster than usual. Like I said, I already know what happens in the first, like, 30 minutes of Marianne's story. So <laughs> just trying to rush through it a little bit. I hope it's okay. Everybody have a wonderful evening. And I will see you all on the next episode. Bye!